good afternoon everybody welcome to this day for which we have been waiting for quite some time i request professor kamraj to escort professor eg ramchandran professor d banerji professor k ram murthy on to the dais please i also request professor uday chakingal also to come on to the dais So for any metallurgist, it will be like a festival to have Professor EGR amongst all of us. And we are really grateful to him for having been able to come and be amongst us today for this function. All of you are aware that this lecture series in the name of Professor E.G. Ramchandran has been started in 2013 with a generous support from one of our alumnus, Shri Pukhra Jain and then a number of others join hands and we have been able to set up a fund in the name of this lecture series and we started this in 2013 with Professor Ranganathan giving the first lecture and then another stalwart from metallurgy coming from this institute an alumnus of this place uh, Mr. Muthuraman who gave the second lecture and today we have another alumnus, a distinguished alumnus from this institute going to give the third lecture. I welcome all of you for this function and I now request Professor Kamraj if you can say a few words as opening the mark, sir. Very good afternoon. On behalf of the department, I welcome you once again for this uh, Professor E.G. Ramachandran Distinguished Lecture Series. This is the third one which we are organizing. The first two are, you may be knowing, the first one was given by uh, Professor Ranganathan from IEC Bangalore and uh, second one was given by Mr. Muthraman from Tata Steel and third one is Dr. Banerjee is going to give this distinguished lecture on this uh, occasion. And once again, I welcome you all for this lecture series. And you are very lucky that you can see the first head of the Department of Metallurgical Engineering Department. <laughs> so with this, uh, now I request uh, uh, Professor K. Ramurthy give a presidential address. Thank you. Good afternoon, all of you. I have a great pleasure to be present here. Uh, I, I'm an odd man out in this uh, family function. Uh, I am glad to see the right from first HODs and uh, all the colleagues uh, who have uh, retired from uh, metallurgy department and also my younger colleagues are here. <clears throat> So many of them uh, with whom I have worked closely or interacted, it's a homecoming for them. So, uh, sir, we thank you uh, for coming all the way um, to attend this lecture, your own, uh, you know, the third lecture of E.G. Ramachandran uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. 
And um, as you all know, Professor Deepankar Manerji has been uh, closely associated with our institute. He has been our board member, and uh, he has also been uh, he has been a well-wisher of IIT Madras, and he has been a very close associate uh, with uh, any opportunity he associates himself with the Metallurgy Department of IIT Madras. And he was also part of the departmental peer review, which occurred last year. And the dedication with which the team uh, worked, along you know, in which Professor Deepankar Banerjee was involved in uh, the way they have gone through the departmental thing and the way they have uh, 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 the way they have brought out the report uh, was amazing. And uh, <clears throat> I thank uh, Professor Deepankar Banerjee for coming forward. And uh, a word of uh, advice for uh, research scholars. Uh, as Dean Academic Courses, some of my colleagues may not agree with me, but as Dean Academic Courses, I have a strong feeling, uh, it may be my personal feeling, that uh, many think that students learn inside the classroom. I have a belief, I have a strong belief uh, that students learn more outside the classroom than what they learn inside the classroom. Sheer stay of four years, five years in the campus, let you be a B.Tech student or a dual degree or a research scholar, you learn more through these type of lectures, peer interaction amongst your friends, what you learn from uh, informal discussions with uh, faculty colleagues here is much more uh, than what you learn inside the thing. So this, my request is make sure that you take time off to attend such lectures which will open up your horizons, which will throw up more ideas for your future uh, research career. So uh, with this, I wish um, the metallurgy department in the coming years to carry forward uh, by bringing in eminent people across the country, across the globe for this lecture, then I wish this uh, Professor E.G. Ramachandran Distinguished Lecture Series um, you know, uh, is taken to uh, different heights. Thank you. All the best. Respected teachers and beloved colleagues, please permit me to introduce Professor E.G. Ramachandran, mainly for the benefit of the younger crowd. Uh, Professor E.G. Ramchandran obtained his B.Sc. Physics and M.Sc. Physics from the University of Mysore in 1943 and 1944 respectively. And then he obtained his Ph.D. in 1947 from the University of Sheffield, UK at an age of 22 years. He then worked for nine years at the Indian Institute of Science Department of Metallurgy as a faculty member and then as an assistant director, National Metallurgical Laboratory in Jamshedpur for five years. And then he moved to the Department of Metallurgy, IIT Madras, as the first professor and the first head of the department here. Uh, professor E.J. Ramchandran has published a lot. Uh, he has published twice in uh, Nature uh, in, uh, during his stay at uh, Jamshedpur. And he was the president of the uh, Indian Institute of Metals during 1980 and 81. Uh, he retired from IIT Madras in 1985. Professor E.J. Ramchandran has set up the department which has come a long way, of which we are all part of. I uh, request uh, Professor Ejia to kindly say a few words for the benefit of the younger crowd here. Professor Ramamurthy, Dr. Banerjee, Professor Kamraj, and my young friends. It is marked as words of wisdom. Don't expect any wisdom from me. I just want to share a few thoughts which may not always be wise to hear and not so wise <clears throat> to follow. I'm very glad that Dr. Banerjee has consulted to give this lecture. After a brilliant career at IIT Madras, he has had an illustrious service with the Defense Department 
first at Hyderabad and next at Delhi. Subsequently, after retirement, he joined the Indian Institute of Science, where I was a staff member nearly 60 years back. In fact, I joined the Department of Metallurgy, as it was then known, in 1947 and served there till 1956, which makes it quite a long period in my life. I was just telling him that I knew his father, who was at the institute for a couple of years when I was there. And I must say that he bears a strong resemblance to his father. I don't know what specifically I should say on this occasion. Every year, for the last three years, I am extremely gratified at the reception I am having at the hands of Professor Murthy and Professor Kamaraj. And I am truly grateful to them for all that they say have said about me, all that they do for me. I am very glad to see here some old friends, Mr. Ramakrishnan and Mr. Mrs. Ramakrishnan, my particularly good friends and well-wishers are here, sitting in the second row. Padmanabhan, Venuvaval, Prabhakar, Patak, all colleagues with whom I shared some very happy years when I was at the institute. And I'm very glad to be once again amongst them and share some of these thoughts with them. The subject of today's lecture is something which makes everybody wonder at the miracle of flight. <clears throat> no doubt it was aluminum which paved the way for the first all-metal aircraft. In the first aircraft, there was not much of metal, but a lot of canvas and such other materials as could withstand the wind generated by the moving plane while on the ground and while in the air. And it was at rather low altitudes that the first airplanes flew. But now, aluminum, though it forms and its alloys, though they form the bulk of materials in an aircraft, there are a lot of strategically important materials which go into an aircraft and particularly in regard to its engine and I'm anxious to hear Dr. Banerjee speak about these new materials. They are not exactly new in the commercial aircraft but quite new in the later versions of the military aircraft and his long association with the Ministry of Defense makes him uni uniquely qualified to speak about these materials. I look forward to his talk and it is not exactly any words of wisdom but words of expectation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor EGR, for sharing your thoughts with us.
It gives me great pleasure in introducing the speaker for the today's uh, third lecture of the Professor E.J. Ramachandran Distinguished Lecture Series, Professor Deepankar Banerjee. Professor Deepankar Banerjee graduated from IIT Madras in 1974 and obtained his doctorate from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1979. He then joined the Defense Metallurgical Research Lab, Hyderabad, and became its director from 1996 to 2003. He was chief controller of R&D of DRDOs during 2003 and 2010. Since 2010, he is a professor at the Department of Materials Engineering in IISC Bangalore. Professor Banerjee is, a well known, is well known for his work on titanium alloys and titanium aluminum based intermetallics for high temperature applications. Professor Banerjee is a distinguished alumnus of IIT Madras and is currently on its board of governors. He served as president of the Indian Institute of Metals in 2010. He is a fellow of all Indian academies of sciences and engineering. He has received numerous honors, including Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in 1993, Padma Shri in 2005, and DRDO's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. With this, I would like to invite Professor Deepankar Banerjee to deliver this lecture. Professor Ramjanan, Professor Ramuti, my, uh, my teachers in IIT Madras, many of whom are here, my colleagues in the faculty of IIT Madras, students, uh, Professor Nagarajan. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary privilege to be able to give this talk, and I want to thank you for that. It is, it's, it, it, and it is particularly moving uh, that Professor Ramchandran is here today. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored by that. I did not have an opportunity, unfortunately, to be taught by Professor Ramchandran. I, uh, when I joined the department, and in the, it was a five-year course, of course, and in the last three years, I think he was away in Germany. So I did not take any of his classes. But, uh, but I'm deeply indebted to the department and, and to the culture and ethos of the department that he has, its first had shaped in many ways. As I'm adapted to my current department, which he also shaped when he was in the Indian Institute of Science, and indeed uh, indebted to the metallurgical community as a whole, which he provided such wonderful leadership to. It's, it's a wonderful experience for me to be here and to give this talk in his presence. A few words about the talk itself, and, and it's essentially addressed to the students uh, and it's a small story. When I, when I was young, I wanted to be a pilot. And of course, uh, as you grow older, you, you're at a, in an era where you have to do engineering or medicine, right? And, and so I chose medicine. And, and of course, I did the IIT entrance exam. And, and my grades turned out to be pretty poor. I was somewhere in the last uh, 
50 or whatever. And, and, and in those days, if you were in the last 50, there's no way you could do aeronautics. You could only do civil or metallurgy. So I walked into the interview, the interview process here, and I said, I want to do aeronautics. And they said, no aeronautics. Why don't you do civil? You, you learn about structures, and somewhere in the third year, you can uh, shift to aeronautics. So I said, OK, and, and came out. And then I was sitting there with my friends. And uh, 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 Dr. Mutaraman, in his last EGI lecture, sh said that uh, Professor EGR actually uh, moved him and directed him to take up metallurgy and go to Tata Steel. But in my case, it was a German professor who walked out and said, India needs metallurgists. Okay. So on the spur of the moment, I went back to the in interview board and said, I want to do metallurgy. And, and of course, you'd make these decisions uh, with no thought in mind at all. So I went back home. My, my parents, I wondered what they would say. But uh, I had as a neighbor, Professor Brahm Prakash, another doyen of metallurgy. And they said, if uh, Pro Professor Brahm Prakash can be a metallurgist, it's OK. You'll manage. <laughs> so that, that was the way I took up metallurgy. And, and, uh, and of course, the rest. Uh, is interesting because I, I went through metallurgy, my PhD in metallurgy at University of Science, and then joined the Defense Metallurgical Research Lab. But I went to when I went to Delhi, I was looking after its aeronautics programs. So life has a strange way of uh, bringing back your interests in ways that you don't really anticipate. But also that forms the basis of this talk. So here is a, a man whom I have quoted. And uh, he was an amazing man. Most of you may know him uh, through his uh, painting of the Mona Lisa. I'm sure you've seen reproductions. Someone, you, some of you may have seen the actual painting. But Da Vinci also was a, one of the first people who investigated flight. So he put down these copious notes on, on the flight of birds and, and, and so on. And we'll have opportunity to talk about that a little bit later. And, and of course, uh, his, his drawing of something that today resembles a helicopter and probably is the first engineering drawing of a helicopter. So the first flight, which Professor Ramchandran referred to uh, in, his, in his little talk, had, of course, much to owe to Da Vinci. But that first flight, as he pointed out, had just an airframe made of wooden struts, steel, and wire braces, and muslin cloth, the canvas that he talked about. And, uh, and it just flew 37 meters in about 12 seconds. We've come a long way since then. If you, if you look at the scenario today, aviation uh, consumes about 3 to 8 percent of the total energy consumed globally. So this is an exajoules, and, and this, is the, uh, uh, this is the forecast for a, uh, energy consumed by aviation. And I want to point this out because it's an important issue, as we will talk about later. And the total amount of energy consumed by aviation today is actually the total amount of energy consumed by a country. So that is, that is the totality of energy consumption by the aviation energy today. And as important is, is the percentage of emissions from the aviation industry. So uh, typically between uh, 5 and 10 percent of the global carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, uh, and, and of course, uh, the predictions vary a lot as you move along, depending upon what the assumptions are in, in the efficiency of propulsion systems. But, but uh, the emission essentially comes out because of incomplete combustion and, and other effects. And, uh, and the carbon dioxide uh, emitted is about 3 kg per kilogram of fuel. Energy efficiencies have improved enormously in commercial aviation. So if you compare efficiency in terms of, let's say, the aircraft fuel burn per seat uh, and, and compare it to the first jet aircraft, the Comet, in the 1960s, you, you see this enormous improvement in, in specific fuel consumption by an aircraft uh, with the most modern aircraft that is there today. And, and a similar improvement in the thrust specific fuel consumption of engines and in the performance of military engines. And I've gone through all of this to show you that the efficiency contributors are essentially advanced aerodynamics, engine thermodynamics, uh, engine design issues, 
propeller fan designs and weight. And materials, which is what I'm essentially going to talk about, affects both engine thermodynamics and weight, of course. So behind the improvements in efficiencies of aircraft and its propulsion systems uh, lies the use of materials uh, in, in both in, in terms of performance as well as in terms of weight. And you can see this in a very simplistic equation, but nevertheless an equation which gives you a feel of the parameters involved. And this is a range equation. And it tells you that an aircraft range is, is dependent upon the thrust specific fuel consumption, the velocity, of course, the lift by drag, which is aerodynamics, and importantly, structural weight. And, and combat performance, again, you look at things like the climb rate, which is thrust minus drag divided by the weight, and the sustained turn rate, how, with what velocity can it turn at a constant velocity, all of these have weight as parameters. So both the thrust specific fuel consumption and the weight are again extremely materials intensive. Materials have been part of flight systems forever and ever. If you look at this very early myth, and I want to remind you about this myth, this Greek myth, and, and Didalus and his son Icarus were imprisoned on an island, and the father built wings for the son, which were held together, which were made of feathers held together by wax in this myth. And of course, he warned the sun not to fly too close to the sun, as the wax would melt, and not too close to the sea, as the wax would become humid and dampen, and, and make it too hard to fly. So a very early intimation of the criticality of materials in flight, and what, what the sun did in his enthusiasm when he learned how to fly, was to fly too close to the sun, so that his uh, wax melted. And he, and he died by going into the sea. And it tells you something about materials, something about design envelopes, something about the use of materials, uh, which pervades uh, materials in today's modern aircraft. So what of today's modern aircraft? And I have this talk divided into two parts. Let's look at the airframe first of all. Airframe skin temperatures vary according to the sustained velocity or cruise velocity of the aircraft. So typically at subsonic velocities, you'd, you'd see temperatures of about 100 to 150 degrees centigrade, more like 125. And as the velocities rise, temperatures rise quite steeply to temperatures which could be as high as 1,015 to 2,000 when you reach hypersonic velocities. And immediately in a broad sense, that sets the limits on the kind of materials that you can use in aircraft. So in typical subsonic aircraft use polymer matrix composites in aluminum, if you go to high supersonic speeds, you have to transit to titanium. And if you have to use, if you go to hypersonic vehicles, you have to use refractory metals or carbon-carbon composites or carbon ceramic matrix composites. So the first all-metal aircraft, and Professor Ramchandran referred to this, was actually, a, as was actually made of iron. But there was just one aircraft which was made of iron, which, which flew in 1915, and then it transisted completely, as Professor Ramchand had pointed out, to, to duralumin, which is an alloy of aluminum and copper. And, and, and this aircraft was, was designed by junkers of Germany. If you look at aluminum itself, the basis of aluminum production was laid in 1886. And, and, and uh, the precipitation hardening effect that all of you are so familiar with was, was discovered in 1906. And there's a story here, which is, I think, a very instructive story. Uh, I've heard it secondhand, so I can't vouch for the complete truth of the story. But of course, metallurgy in the days that uh, aluminum was being in, uh, investigated was dominated by the knowledge of steel. And, and steel is all about quenching to form martensite and making it hard and then tempering it to get the right sort of properties. And what people were trying to do in those days was to follow that background knowledge. So they quenched lots of aluminum alloys and looked at its hardness and after quenching to see if you can get a hard martensite. And that was what Alfred Wilm was doing. And, and uh, one Friday, his postdoctoral student quenched an alloy of aluminum and copper, but he forgot to take the hardness. He forgot, he forgot to take the hardness because he, it was Friday evening. He had an appointment with his girlfriend and so on. That's far more important than 
measuring hardness and quenched materials. So off he went. And he was back on Monday morning, and he measured the hardness, and the hardness had increased enormously. Natural aging, which all of you are familiar with now. So very serendipitous uh, discovery, but it tells you something about, uh, about play being as important as work in, in your scientific lives. Uh, but there's another aspect of, of the development of materials that I want to point out to you. This material was discovered in 1906. It was flown in aircraft in the 1950s. But look, you tried, started to understand what happened, decreasing solid solubility of copper and aluminum, which leads to the precipitation hardening effect in 1921, and, and, and the slip interaction with precipitates, the, the understanding of dislocations in 1934, and the actual observation of dislocations in 1955. So the science of the material came well after the engineering of the material and its use in aircraft. So don't ever be under the impression that there is a linear relationship between science and engineering. Science leads to engineering, engineering leads to science. It's all a lovely helical relationship which allows the development of materials and its application in engineering. And, and, and those, those relationships are very hard to define indeed. But of course, aluminum today has increasingly been replaced by composites for subsonic applications, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and, and this is an example of the single aircraft that had a completely titanium airframe. And this was the SR-71. The SR-71 actually replaced a, a high-altitude aircraft called the U-2. It was a sur surveillance aircraft which got shot down by a Russian missile. And then they wanted to fly higher and faster and at uh, Mark 3.2, the only material that you could use uh, in aircraft uh, is, is a beta titanium alloy, which is being investigated even today. And of course, as you go into hypersonic velocities, you start using entirely different materials. Uh, what about composites then? Uh, if, if you look at the use of composites, and our light combat aircraft today, uh, uses uh, something like 40% uh, uh, by weight of composites. And, and we've learned how to use and design compos with the composites. The stresses that are on the wings of a bird as it flies, uh, the projection system is uh, not all that great, but oops. Yeah. The stresses on the wings of a bird as it flies are actually quite similar to the stresses that an aircraft encounters as it, as it uh, maneuvers. So this is a highly magnified view of the elastic distortions of an aircraft such as this as it maneuvers. And, uh, and we have learned, therefore, how to design and use composites in these highly demanding situations Today's composites, for example, manufactured at the National Aeronautical Laboratory and the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited are flying, as I said, about 40% by weight on this aircraft. And the testing of these composites extend from coupon level tests to uh, scale tests to actual tests on the full aircraft where you have the entire aircraft mounted on various hydraulic jacks to simulate those elastic distortions that the aircraft encounters as it flies. So the use of materials is not just the development material. It has also got a huge amount to do with the way you test the material to meet the standards of safety that any mandated vehicle uh, must conform to. But composites have different advantages. And the increasing use of composites, one of the thrust is towards increasing temperature capability. Today's composites are limited to about 125 degrees centigrade. As you, as you go to higher temperatures in composites, they become embrittled. So you have to engineer matrix materials which allow you to increase temperature while retaining plasticity in the composites. But the key advantage of composites in the future will be that they can be precisely engineered to loading through automated 3D textile engineering to obtain control fiber spacing, directionality, and dimensionality. And, and an example of that kind of uh, 
uh, that kind of work and the way composites are designed can be taken from looking at nature. And so here's the work of uh, Professor Ramchandra Rao and co-workers looking at the strength of bamboo and you can see how the fiber material has a higher density towards the surfaces than in the center and of course the higher density at the surfaces is required to withstand the higher tensile stress at the surfaces. So these are the ways you can actually today design composites to precisely take care of local loading conditions in your aircraft or whatever applications that you're looking at. There are other ways you can use composites today and that is in relation to functionality and I'll talk a little bit about that. If you look at what you want out of the lift of the aircraft, you want a very wide wing which provides you lift at low velocities. If you want high velocities, you have to have a swept back wing and the LCA is, a, is an intermediate between the two. So you can see two curvatures in the surfaces over there providing you with the supersonic capability as well as lift. But of course, you can see that, that the wing configuration varies depending upon whether you want low speed lift or a high speed velocity. But what about, so you have today an extraordinary variety of wings because of this. A flying wing, which removes the fuselage altogether, the forward swept wing, the aircraft almost looks as if it's flying backwards, this Boeing model, which is another version of the flying wing, an oblique wing, and a mosquito which generates its lift through an entirely different process. Uh, all of this really derives from a knowledge of the flight of birds. So what birds have is a way of changing their wing shape and, and, and direction and configuration, if you wish, uh, during flight. And wouldn't it be wonderful if you could do that in, in real aircraft as well, such that you can transition through the entire regime of flight, all the domains of flight, by simple changes in wing geometry as a bird does. But of course, the challenges are enormous. And the key challenges are shape changes under very high dynamic pressures. So you need distributed controls on airfoil surfaces. You need to understand the fluid structure control interaction system. And you need materials. You need smart materials which respond to those distributed controls in a, in a, in a very specified manner. So you would look at shape memory materials, piezoelectric materials, magnetostrictive or magnetorheological fluids. And many of these materials also need to be multifunctional as a bird's wings are. So the bird's wings, as we have pointed out, not only provide thrust and lift and change shape and direction as birds fly, depending upon what they want to do, but they're multifunctional. They're water repellent, ultraviolet resistant, thermal insulation, and regenerative. This is the kind of example that materials engineers are looking at to design what are called adapt adaptive wing structures. So essentially these are evolving advanced polymer matrix composites which can be integrated with various control systems and materials to give you strong flexible skins that can, whose shape can be locally changed to the pressures of flight as you go through different flight domains. And the kind of materials that you'd use for those are, are, are this entire range and, and they have, uh, and they are characterized by the strain they can produce, by the stress they can act against, their energy density, and, and very importantly, the actuation speed as well. So the National Program on Smart Materials and, and uh, the Aeronautical Development Agency's uh, programs are exploring these issues in, in adaptive wing structures today, as, as is work at IIT Madras at this time. There's another use of multifunctionality that, extreme, that is extremely important for aircraft, and that is the use of, that is its use in stealth. Uh, most of stealth in aircraft comes from simply shaping. So the way aircraft are shaped is, is a sort of multidisciplinary optimization where you don't allow incoming, uh, incoming radar waves to bounce back in the direction that they came from but you reflect them in different directions so that the radar receiver, the microwave receiver, cannot detect the, the bounce back uh, radar waves. Much of this is done by shape, and that shape has to be combined with aerodynamics, which is why I called it multidisciplinary optimization. But we have established techniques of the Defense Research and Development Organization at our laboratory in Jodhpur, for example, to look at radar reflections locally, not as a global 
uh, aircraft, but what happens locally? So even if you shape aircraft, you still find that things like engine intakes with curvatures, its exhaust systems, the nose, and so on, which has to conform to various kinds of aerodynamic res requirements, still give you substantial local reflections of microwave. And what we found is that you then need to combine aerodynamics and the shaping of wings with the use of stealth materials, which can substantially reduce such reflections. So there's a variety of materials that can be used. We talked about regenerative materials uh, in, in terms of bird feathers. And here is an example of the work going on in the Defense Research and Development Organization, again, in terms of regenerative composites. So the question and the challenges are, can you intersperse in your composite material uh, resin filled in microcapsules, which will uh, crack when a crack intercepts the microcapsules, the resin will emerge and then heal the cracks. These, these are enormous challenges uh, uh, in terms of actual design of materials, but this is the kind of work that you can do to look at self-healing materials. So a variety of ways in which composite materials will involve to impart multifunction, multifunctionality in terms of both adaptive structures, in terms of healing, in terms of sensing, and, and so on in the future. As we move to higher and higher temperatures, and, and, and this is a schematic drawing of a hypersonic vehicle uh, of the Defense Research and Development Laboratory, and, and, and the, now the materials required are completely different. So for example, you have temperatures about 800 degrees centigrade, reaching to 1300 degrees at these leading edges and so on. And so you require two types of materials. You require carbon silicon carbide types of composites, and you require thermally insulating materials which will be placed on top of these structures to, 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 to actually provide thermal insulation to the materials below. We have, we have looked at the development of carbon silicon carbide composites. Short-term use has been engineered at, at the Advanced uh, uh, Laboratory Systems Laboratory in Hyderabad for carbon-carbon composites, but carbon-carbon composites, while excellent as re-entry vehicles for short-term use, are not suitable for very long-term use, as aircraft might require. For that, you require carbon-silicon carbide composites, so silicon carbide, silicon carbide composites. So we have developed this entire range of uh, materials, starting with polycarbosylane from a laboratory in Kanpur, to silicon carbide fiber, which has, been, uh, which has used this polymeric precursor to form fibers, the weaving of the fibers, the, the chemical vapor infiltration to form actual shapes and so on at the National Nautical Laboratory. And, and, and one of the things that you would have noticed from all of this is that much of these are really multinational, multi-laboratory programs. There is not a single institution that can do all of this, and it requires the combined effort of many institutions uh, to really develop advanced materials of this kind. I want to move to engines. And aero engines, of course, run on a thermodynamic cycle whose efficiency depends on the highest temperature you can reach in the cycle. And the highest temperature is the temperature that you reach where you combine the air delivered at high pressures by the compressor. You combine it with fuel in the combustor, and that air is then allowed to expand through the turbine to drive the turbine. So the materials in aero engines are the story really of three materials. Titanium in the front stages, nickel-based superalloys in the turbines, and, and, and an entry of ceramic matrix composites of the kind that I talked to you about at, at the end of the engine, where even if they crack up, they're relatively safe. The story of titanium is, of course, an Indian story. We have some of the largest deposits of uh, titanium in the world. I, I think this is, uh, this is India here, so the fourth largest deposits of titanium ore in the world. Uh, this is a picture of the beach sands of Kerala, and, and the color of this black sand is the color of the titanium ore, ilmenite. So you have to separate ilmenite from, from the rest of the sand. You have to purify it. And then you have to transform it to titanium ore. And that's the technology that was uh, established at the Defense Metallurgical Research Lab many years ago. And, and, and it tells you a story about how technology is developed. The first work on uh, zirconium and uh, uh, refinement and so on was actually done by Brahm Prakash and Sundaram at the Indian Institute of Science. 
and they then moved to the atomic energy and the first small batches of titanium zirconium extraction were developed uh, at, at the atomic energy in uh, the Bhabha Atomic Research Center by Sundaram and Brahm Prakash. And, and then the technology migrated to the nuclear fuels complex in Hyderabad where R.B. Subramaniam took up the development of uh, titanium technology on a small scale. But, but, uh, but the atomic energy was interested in zirconium and not titanium. So the development and scaling up of titanium technology didn't receive that attention at, at the nuclear and fuels complex. And so the entire technology was migrated to the Defense Metallurgical Research Lab by Arnachalam, who brought R.B. Subramaniam to DMRL. And, and this is how the technology of uh, titanium extraction was established. And, and then the funding to establish a production plant at the Kerala Minerals and Metals Limited, which is on the beach shores of Kerala, came from the Indian Space Research Organization because there were enormous problems in, in adequate supply of titanium alloys on time. And, and so today we, uh, we have this plant commissioned in 2012, which makes about, uh, uh, and, and about 90 batches and totally about 300 tons of material has been used and is under certification for aerospace grade use. But this is just titanium as a raw material. You have then to convert it into alloys, you have to process it and you have to make parts out of it. And, and our capability in that regard in this country comes through the Mishra Dhatu Nigam Limited, our Ministry of Defense production agency for titanium alloys uh, to produce mill forms and semi-finished products our research and development capability at DMRL, our user GTRE uh, forging companies such as Bharat Forge and the HL Foundry and Forge. And today we have a well-established line for critical titanium alloy part manufacture through these agencies, including aerospace disks, engine disks, and engine blades and rings, all of which constitute the front part of these aero engines. And titanium is widely used, not just in aero engines, but also in our aircraft. So here's a variety of products through, through, developed through similar manufacturing routes that are used in the light combat aircraft. Currently a program on to establish uh, titanium undercarriage components to replace steel. But I do want to point out to you that for every 120 kilograms of finished weight per aircraft, you actually use three tons of sponge. That is the bye-bye fly ratio of titanium because of its exhaust, uh, extraordinary ability for oxygen and therefore the loss of material as you start from the titanium raw material to the final part that you see over here. And we use titanium uh, manufactured in similar ways for a space program, whether it be in uh, gas bottles or or propellant tanks or seamless tubing and, and various separation systems in our uh, Indian Space Research Organization vehicles. So there is a maturity in titanium in this country, uh, right from the raw material to the final product and its actual application in, in engineering systems. How will titanium move forward? Well, hollow titanium blades, for example, used in, in the first stages of the Rolls-Royce Trent engine to reduce weight, the combination of titanium blades and disks in a welded form so that you, you reduce the mechanical stresses of the dovetail joints that are present in, in conventional blade disk configurations, uh, remove the mechanical joints with, with welded joints so that you can save loading on this material and then remove what is called the bore altogether by introducing titanium metal matrix composites in this ring which looks like this. And so these are various alternative structures and forms of titanium alloys that we will evolve to in aero engine applications. But of course the most critical material in aero engines is, is also nickel-based superalloys. And we talked about the efficiency of aero engines, the thermodynamic efficiency being de dependent on how high you can burn the fuel. Okay. And so today's nickel-based superalloys operate at about between 1400 and 1500 degrees centigrade in the turbine of aero engines. And I've superimposed that temperature on the nickel aluminum phase diagram to show you that today's nickel-based superalloys actually operate at temperatures above the melting point of the material. This is incredible, okay? Please think about it, okay? And the way that is done 
is, is, is the actual temperature capability of the material has improved over the years through perspiration hardening and various processing technologies that I'll talk about to about 1100 degrees centigrade, which is also a very high fraction of the melting point. Uh, all of you metallurgists will understand the role of diffusion and so on as you approach the melting point. And, and, and therefore, this is an incredibly high fraction of the melting point for nickel-based superalloys. But uh, I hit the wrong button sometimes, a so mistake, excuse me. But also, an additional improvement in temperature capability comes from cooling. Okay? So these parts that see the highest temperatures are all internally cooled. Okay? So here is the external part, and if you broke it, break it open, it's actually a thin-walled part which has intricate channels for airflow through the part to provide internal cooling. Okay? So blade cooling as one way of increasing the temperature capability. The other way of increasing the temperature capability is to provide ceramic, insulating ceramic materials on, on, on top of these blades, so thermal barrier coatings. So this material system is not just a single material. It's a thin-walled, precipitation-hardened, nickel-based superalloy with oxidation-resistant coatings, on top of which are thermal barrier coatings. It's an extraordinary material system when you remember that these parts are rotating at 10,000 revolutions per minute at temperatures of 1,500 degrees centigrade in an oxidizing atmosphere subject to a variety of alternating loads and you're dealing with a material system which is a thin-walled system, about a millimeter thick in places, of nickel-based superalloy, which has an aluminite coating, an intermetallic coating, on top of which is a ceramic coating. So you can imagine the extraordinary challenges that come about in engineering such material systems, and in the indeed the design of such material systems in, in aircraft today. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about safety in aircraft today a little bit later on. So how do we uh, make those blades? We make it by a process called uh, uh, direction solidification and single crystal manufacturing, which has been developed at uh, DMRL. So you start with the CAD CAM design of those very complicated uh, 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 blade contours. And your die then resembles the external shape of the blade. You put in a ceramic core. Uh, to get the internal cooling, then you pour wax into this dye, and you end up with something li which looks like this. You, you, uh, you dip the wax, which has the ceramic core, into a ceramic slurry. You, you fire the ceramic, make it strong. You remove the wax by steam injection. So you, now you have a hollow with a ceramic core, which resembles the final shape of the blade. And then you cast the material, and you cast it with a controlled heat extraction to give you direction solidification, or if you want, single crystals. So again, a very complex technology for a variety of reasons, because it involves not just metallurgy, it involves uh, die design and fabrication. And why die design is important, you're pouring nickel, you're pouring nickel at 1400 degrees centigrade, and you're meeting complex aerofoil shapes with dimensional tolerances of a fraction of a millimeter. And you're pouring this hot metal into a ceramic system. Imagine the distortions, thermal distortions, that this ceramic core, ceramic shell, and metal undergoes as it cools down in this complex shape. And you have to design your die to engineer the corrections due to these thermal distortions to get the final control of a fraction of millimeter of tolerance on the final shape. Okay? So die design and fabrication. Ceramic processing and handling. You think ceramic is a brittle material. Look at the ceramic core. It has got these uh, finest and most delicate of channels with, with these internal cooling holes that you achieve through uh, ceramic injection molding technology. And finally, you're pouring the metal into this very small gap. That is what the metal is filling. And you can't have ceramic core touching ceramic shell during the pouring process. So you actually pin that in place with platinum needles, and you finally get a blade that looks like this after direction solidification, and, and the half of the blade inside looks like this. And of course, there is the standard metallurgy thing of microstructure and chemistry control in all of this. So an extraordinarily complex technology for an extraordinary application. 
Aircraft engine disks are also made by complex processes. They're no longer made by conventional ingot metallurgy processes. Uh, they are made by powder processes uh, where you, uh, to prevent microsegregation during solidification when you have a very large amount of alloying addition. And, and so powder processes allow you to cool fine powder particles extremely rapidly to prevent microsegregation. And then you can extrude the powder and hip it and so on to get the final shape of that disk. And so the properties of materials have improved enormously over the years. But is there a limit to materials properties in aero engines? Look at titanium alloys. Uh, somewhere around 300 degrees uh, temperature capability as defined by creep capability in, in, in the 1950s and 60s to about, about 500 degrees today. And you're reaching the limits. You can clearly see that with every additional year, your increment in temperature capability is decreasing. And that is also true for nickel-based superalloys. And it's true for every material. As you progress with time, your ability to produce increments in performance decrease steadily. And, and, and some of those uh, limitations come, in the case of titanium alloys, from properties other than mechanical. They come from something called the burn resistance of titanium alloys. When titanium rubs against titanium at high speeds, it catches fire at high temperatures. So the use of titanium in, in rotating components as an aero engines is limited to 500 degrees centigrade to prevent burn. The oxidation resistance of titanium decreases sharply above 500 degrees centigrade. What are the solutions uh, to these emerging limits of material performance? One way of looking at solutions is to look at graded structures. So here's an example of a graded structure uh, engineered at DMRL. And this is an integral rotor part made of nickel-based superalloy. If you conventionally cast the material, you get large coarse grains which look like this, this, which is terrible for fatigue resistance in the bore of the disk. If you vibrate the shell during the process of solidification, you, you, uh, you create large numbers of nuclei for solidification, and you can transit from those coarse grain structures to very fine grain structures. But of course, the grains are fine even in the, even in the blade portions of this material where you require creep, and that's not so good for you. So you can control heat extraction during solidification such that you have fine grain structure in the center and coarse grain directionally solidified structure on the blades. So again, those of you who work in solidification can, can look at this engineering technology which produces the heat extraction during solidification on just one part of the integral casting that you're making while providing a fine grain structure in the center. So metallurgy is not just solidification, it's just not just chemistry, it's just not mechanical behavior. It's a control of heat transfer and million other things uh, to manufacture a part with, with graded structures that can meet with improved performance requirements. What are new materials? Well, here's an example of a new titanium alloy uh, used in today's engine, which powers the Boeing 787. This is an intermetallic, okay? And, and I won't go through this in detail, but, but all I want to tell you is that this intermetallic, TIAL, provides a transition between titanium alloys, conventional titanium alloys, which have temperature limits at 500, to nickel-based alloys, and so that you can start using these at about 600 to 700 degrees centigrade, not uh, uh, in replacement of the highest temperature nickel-based superalloys. But I also want to point out to you that the development of this intermet intermetallic took 56 years. Okay, since the start of work on this material to its final use in the aero engine. Time cycles for the developed materials, especially in man-rated vehicles, is very long. And there are ultra-high temperature materials that, that we are increasingly investigating. These could be based on niobium and silicon, or molybdenum and silicon, and, and the carbon-silicon carbide or silicon carbide composites that I uh, talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, so here is the material story in engines, uh, a sweet spot for titanium in the, in the front part of the engines, increasing use of composite, which is taking over titanium sweet spot in that direction. As we increase the temperatures in the turbine, nickel-based alloys move down in this direction, 
and newer materials based on uh, titanium aluminides and composites uh, start appearing at very high temperatures. All this about materials development, but what about safety? 49% of US Air Force failures are due to fatigue. And, and about 30% of that is due to uh, engine blades uh, as compared to other materials. So understanding the life of materials is, is a critical task. And, and this, again, involves a very wide range of sciences, starting from understanding the core structure of dislocations to the collective motion of dislocations to crystal plasticity techniques, which can be translated to the FEM-based analysis of large structures. So here's an example of work, uh, again, at uh, the Defense Metal Metallurgical Research Laboratory, at this part, uh, combined with uh, GTRE, which does the FEM analysis of disk structures and, and uh, imposes the knowledge of crack growth rates of titanium alloys in the service spectrum encountered by that part in an aero engine to develop a predictive cap capability, at least at that macroscopic scale. But we have to work to link the microscopic scale to that macroscopic scale in terms of future com computation in material science and engineering. And that brings me to the last few slides of this talk. And, and I put them in this morning because I thought uh, uh, these are important issues to look at uh, when you look at academic research. And, and, and that is uh, in the context of aircraft and engines and what is the business model for materials processes and a business model for aircraft and engines. So these are engine development costs shown as negative. This is what companies earn as you go down the years. So new, new sales and maintenance is what the company earns to offset its engine development costs. It's extremely important for a company to de and for all of us uh, working in, 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 in engineering applications to deliver the right product at the right time for a given application. And historically, engine development cycles show much lower times than materials development cycles. And I've talked about this a little bit earlier, and the gap is increasing. Uh, for example, a new composite fan blade and a GE90 engine with a three-dimensional code, uh, aerodynamics code, and 72 iterations took a few weeks. How long do you think the development, the manufacturing technology of the composite material for that blade took? Take? It took about 15 to 20 years. Here's an example of the kind of time frames in the most advanced countries in the world for different types of materials development. So a new material class with no prior application experience takes 20 plus years. And I talked about 50 years for TIN. New materials with an existing alloy system can take about 10 years. Modification of an existing material for critical structural components, four years. Modification and so on, two, two, two to four years. And so why, so, so, so it's important to understand in, in the whole materials and metallurgy field where exactly you're doing your science on. And, and often, let me tell you, we are victims of an incorrect focus in materials and processes in terms of business costs. For example, if someone asks you, is, is a predictive model for dwell fitting in 718 more cost effective in a business sense, or a modified 718 with better fatigue properties, our academic reaction tends to be 718 is an ancient alloy. I want nothing about it. I want to do nothing about it. I only want to develop new alloys. Okay? But the engineering man requires repairability. He wants maintainability. He wants predictability of properties. All of this has far more impact on his business model than a new material which can take 20 years to develop and whose properties anyway you're unsure of in the variety of properties that are required for any critical application. So we have to worry about how we are interacting with, with the businesses in this context. Why does material development take so much time in, 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 in terms of uh, development of critical applications? Well, I mean, one example of the time requirement comes from simply certification, okay? Today's safety standards in aircraft engines what we have achieved today in the aircraft business is about one event in one million flying hours. 
keep my fingers crossed, there hasn't been a critical accident with the light combat aircraft program since its inception 20 years back. Think of what it means to the materials safety that you have incorporated. And that materials safety requires a database, an engineering database, which represents the entire scatter of materials in its final product form, starting from chemistry to the processing, to the manufacturing to the final shape, including secondary fabrication processes such as welding and machining and so on, and heat treatment. And, and at each stage, uh, the properties of materials change as you impose newer and newer cycles on them. And so the final design engineer looks at properties which are something like a minus three sigma of all of this conducted at scales which are typical of the actual final product. So certification of materials is a demanding, expensive, time-consuming process. Okay? So I want to repeat again, the, the flying public requires Low ticket cost, safe flight, non-stop capability. Engineering translates that into reliability, acquisition costs, maintenance costs, and repair. The materials industry delivers properties, density, NDE, repair, high yield processes, materials availability, low cost materials, defect free processes, consistent properties. And many of us are in academics tend to focus just on that, on that bottom part. Uh, we have to be different in academics. Uh, to interact with industry. And we have to understand in an integrated form with new links between materials and process development, the design and the supply chain, how we develop materials. This is easy to say. It's far more difficult to practice. It's difficult to practice because the language and culture of designers, I'm talking about technical language, is very different from the language of the material scientist. The, 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 there are no standards, tools, and processes used across all these industries. There are organizational priorities. A manufacturing agency may have organization priorities different from an aircraft industry. Our reward systems in academics reward research, which is at the forefront of an international peer group, far more than it rewards research, which is directed towards engineering application. That is something that all of us understand. It is a system that we live in. There are IPR-related issues. So these are things that we, we have uh, struggled with over the years in the context of uh, strategic uh, systems development and in the relation of materials for strategic systems development. And, and, and that is indeed why the interaction between materials engineering, academics, research groups, people who make actual products, has not often been as good as it should have been in this country. But I continue to hope. Okay. So I end with the last slide. What are the challenges? Performance, efficient, efficiency, multifunctionality, emissions, noise, and safety continue to be important challenges for the aerospace industry in flight, and materials will continue to play a key role in the way that I've talked about. Thank you very much. request Professor Kamraj to come forward to honor our guests with a small memento. Professor Deep Energy for the excellent talk. As usual, he is. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also request Professor Kamraj to give a moment to Professor E.G. Ramchandran. Just about a month back, he has completed 90 years. You can imagine <laughs> the energy that he still has, which most of us youngsters, we still, I don't think we have. Uh, it's just because of possibly the passion that he has to, to the, the field of metallurgy that he has, which inspires all of us all these years. So I now request uh, uh, Uday to come forward to give the vote of thanks.
On behalf of the organizing committee, it's my great pleasure to give the vote of thanks on this occasion. First of all, I thank Professor Ramurthy, the director in charge IIT Madras, and Professor E.G. Ramachandran for gracing this occasion. I also thank family members and friends of Professor E.G. Ramachandran for gracing this occasion. And thanks are due to Professor Deepankar Banerjee for delivering a very informative and entertaining lecture. And it's a pleasure, always a pleasure to meet the retired faculty of our department. I'm very glad that you know, they could take the time to come here and I thank them for it. And I thank all my colleagues, students, and, and the audience present here for attending this lecture. Okay. Uh, thank uh, Dean ICSR and the staff of ICSR for making, this, uh, ex making the excellent venue available for this pro program. And more importantly, I thank all the alumni donors who have made this lecture series possible and we hope for their continued support. So thank you very much, and high tea is arranged in the dining area. Please join us for that. Thank you. Friends, I forgot to mention why Uday is here, not only as our colleague, but because this particular uh, program that we have been organizing every year is always uh, supported by IAM Chennai chapter. He is uh, the vice president, vice chairman of the IAM Chennai chapter. So we thank IAM Chennai chapter for their continued support to this event. Thank you. Thank you, Uday. So I request all of you to join for a high tea in the dining hall. Yes, sir, I'm coming.